Good evening, and welcome to Copernic Observatory. My name is Drew Desker. I'm the director here at Copernic. It's great uh, to have you here uh, this evening for uh, tonight's program, and uh, also want to welcome those people that are just uh, coming in here from our uh, family STEM hour that learned about and built their own hovercraft. So uh, uh, they get a chance to experiment with that at home a little bit more, which would be great. So um, uh, you guys are uh, into in for actually two two treats. Uh, Professor Oldfield just really knows his rocks, <laughs> and uh, so we're going to get deep into that. Um, but also tonight's skies are just outstanding. They are um, absolutely clear. It's also a moonless night, which means that um, that pesky moon is not going to blot out uh, a lot of the um, the dimmer stars and, and galaxies and, and nebulas. So um, we'll be able to. Uh, 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 after the program, invite you out and uh, take a look at, uh, at the night sky through our telescopes. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn are just absolutely uh, pristine. That it's, it's it's good seeing tonight. So you can actually see the uh, what's called the equatorial bands in, Ju in Jupiter, and the of course the uh, the uh, the rings of uh, of Saturn. So just um, I'm going to switch the uh, camera around here a little bit so for those on the live stream can can watch. Um, uh, who's here for the first time? Raise your hand. All right, a fair number of people. All right, very good. Uh, who here are members of Copernic? Oh, probably the other half. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> well, um, it's I'm really glad, uh, especially for the newcomers that you that you made it up here tonight. Um, but what I wanted to point out was um, the people that raised their hands second um, actually have um, have special knowledge, a special power. Uh, Copernic belongs to a a group of science centers called the uh, ASTC, Association of Science and Technology Centers. And a Copernic membership actually gets you into 350 other uh, science centers. So you could go to the uh, to the Ravisi Museum, you could go to the Museum of Science and Technology up in Syracuse, or Science Center in Ithaca, or the Intrepid Museum down in New York City, or the Franklin Institute down in um, in Philly. And, and you get in for free. So. Um, if you like, uh, if you like this kind of thing, uh, consider getting a, uh, a Copernic membership. Uh, one of the other things we're also doing here is, uh, well, we have a couple things to announce. Um, uh, Copernic is, we're obviously a, a, a pretty uh, decent observatory, um, but we are we're really a, an informal STEM education uh, facility, and uh, we've been around for almost 50 years now. And we offer programs uh, in the summer uh, for kids and also on school holidays. In fact, we have one coming up right now um, next Thursday night, uh, uh, next Thursday day, pardon me, uh, uh, the Veterans Day holiday is a school holiday. And we are running a, 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 uh, an event called Girl Power. And it's called Girl Power Artemis. And now, if you remember your Greek uh, mythology, Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo. And now let's bring you into the... <laughs> Uh, the 20th century, Apollo, we, we think of as that uh, mission that went to, to the moon. Well, Artemis is the next mission to go to the back to the moon, and we will actually have uh, the first woman on the moon. So 
our growth higher Artemis is going to focus on uh, girls that are between uh, third and eighth grade, and trying to we're trying to engage more women in STEM. And so, uh, if you know of a, uh, in fact, I think there's one here already. I see that's already signed up. Elsa is going to be there. But if you know of any uh, other, uh, a girl somewhere between uh, third and eighth grade that uh, would like to explore a little bit more about the Artemis program, um, go to our website and you can get signed up. We still have, we still have some room. Uh, the other thing we're doing uh, coming up uh, next Saturday, actually, is uh, we are partnering with the uh, Binghamton Philharmonic. The um, Binghamton Philharmonic next weekend is doing a, their Ascend concert, which has three pieces, one of which is Mozart's Symphony No. 41, which is also called the Jupiter Symphony. So we're actually going to bring our telescopes down to the forum and uh, be outside so uh, you can actually see Jupiter before you hear Jupiter. That's usually the way it works. You always see something before you hear it, right? So um, anyway, uh, to back up a little bit, next Friday we're, we're, our program will actually be a, um, a preview of the James Webb Telescope. Uh, this is a telescope that is actually will be the largest telescope we've ever put into orbit. And... Um, it's uh, scheduled to get launched in December, and actually, uh, we uh, it, it, the main program will be presented by one of our educators, Tish Brizzy, but also uh, we will having will have zoomed in uh, Dr. Michelle Thaller, uh, who works at the Goddard Space Flight Center, and um, her late husband actually was working on the James Webb Telescope, so uh, she has some particularly unique uh, insight to that. So, anyway, lots of good stuff uh, coming up, and of course, uh, always on Black Friday. We have black holes on Black Friday, so uh, you can uh, escape the crowds and come on up here for uh, for a program on Black Friday. So the thing about uh, Copernic, we really are focused on sort of lifelong uh, lifelong learning and, and trying to help people to really understand how things uh, how how the world works and how the universe works. And it's not just that's just always astronomy. So um, tonight's program is, in fact, we were fortunate to have. Uh, 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 Professor Oldfield able to uh, uh, to come and present for us. He's been here a number of times, and uh, it's uh, he always draws a, a great crowd. So, uh, in fact, I'm going to pan back around here again so the people on the uh, live stream can see uh, you know what you're missing. <laughs> it's a great uh, uh, great opportunity here. So, yep. Oh, you can wave. Yeah, absolutely. It's just wave to everybody on the live stream. <laughs> there you go. And by the way, uh, since uh, since last uh, last spring, we've started uh, doing live streaming because we had to close down uh, at least uh, to public programs and all of our live streams are actually on our YouTube channel. So if you missed a program, you can always go back and watch it on a live stream. Um, and um, so that's always a useful thing. We actually have like 2,500, almost 2,600 uh, subscribers on our, on our YouTube uh, uh, channel. And actually uh, Jeremy, our uh, live stream astronomer will be uh, uh, live streaming the lunar eclipse on November 19th. Now the challenge there is it's going to start at 1 p 1 a.m. So um, we will not be open per se, but you can watch it on the live stream. Well, anyway, we're going to move right into our program. Um, so, uh, Professor, let's uh, actually good to turn your uh, mic on. Okay, you have the O N O F F switch into the O N position, and that'll be just like that. And can you hear me now? I would probably bring this up a little bit more. Okay. Just Let's try that. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, yeah, let's get everybody in here. We, we have a number of people standing in the back, so come on, come on and have a seat. Do you have a question already? Okay, hello. <clears throat> okay, now, um, I'm not sure where uh, I'm going to stand here, so let me at least introduce myself. While, while we're getting people so settled. My name is Bruce Oldfield. Um, although I wasn't born in Binghamton, I've been here since I was three, so I consider myself a, a, a native. And I, I grew up in Endwell, and I had this great education at Maine Endwell High School. And one of the things that I, I, I found is that there was this creek in Endwell that has tons and tons of fossils in it. And I got really interested in the fossils. When I was nine years old, my older brother, Mark, who was in the fifth grade, 
had to do a science project, and he went into the creek and collected some rocks and did some kind of a project. And my, my older brother's a bit of a jerk. Um, perhaps some of you siblings understand that. Uh, he was a bit of a jerk, and I knew I could do better than him. And so I went into the creek, and I collected rocks, and collected rocks, and collected rocks, and now I have a problem, <laughs> a real serious problem. The interesting thing is, is that I stuck with rocks. I went to Broome Community College. It was Broome Tech at the time, uh, Binghamton University. SUNY Cortland. I've got degrees from various different places. I'm also a certified gemologist, of all things. Um, that was just an opportunity I had offered to me, and I took it. Um, in 1975, I got hired at BCC to teach geology, and that was great. So I've been in this area for a long time. My um, degrees are actually focused on the rocks of this area. I might claim that I know the rocks of this area very well, and I, I would agree with myself on that. Um, incidentally, I went into teaching, got paid a teacher's salary. My older brother that was the jerk went into banking and was actually a bank president for a while, and worked for Bank One, and he got checks, paychecks this big, and I got paychecks this big, and I'm not sure who won that competition. But I never stopped collecting rocks, and I never stopped loving the rocks in, in this area. Of all places I could have grown up, I grew up in a place that has no dinosaur fossils. We're going to start at the beginning here. There are no dinosaur fossils in New York State that are native to New York State. We don't have rocks of the right age, and we'll, we'll see why in a moment. Um, so there's no dinosaurs for me to, to collect. But interestingly enough, the geology of this area is really unique. We live on an ancient shoreline, 365 million years ago. Can, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. 365 million years ago, Binghamton was on a shoreline. And if you went west from Binghamton or north from Binghamton, it was water. It was marine water. If you went south or east, it was land. So in a way, I couldn't have grown up in a better place to find a variety of different fossils. Not only that, we live in an in an area whose rocks are of a geologic time that things were ch rapidly changing on the earth. We were going from a previous state with just marine fossils to things crawling out of the water and starting to populate the land. And I'm not talking about just, you know, things that crawl, but things like plants, trees, ferns, things like that are all going through this transition at the age of the rocks in this area. So I don't think I could have grown up in a better place. Got a great education, got some great rocks. Now I have a problem getting rid of them. So, incidentally, how many children do we have here tonight? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, good. So I'll apologize to you children first. I, haven't, I, I, I tend to talk like a college professor. I'm going to use a lot of big words, and I'm sorry it's a bit confusing to you, but there's a prize at the end. I, I brought a bride to get you to stick to it. I brought you a little bag of rocks. So stick around. If, well, if we'll, I act childish, can I have one of those bags of rocks? Well, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Can we start the PowerPoint, please? Okay, so that's me, not, not, not the fossil. That's my name, Bruce Oldfield. Um, 
I'm going to presume this advances. Nope. This advances. Nope. This isn't on. Here we go. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to treat you like a college class, and I'm going to talk fast and talk loud and show a lot of complicated things, including diagrams that look like mush. So if we were to strip off all of the soil and gravel and plants and water and everything in New York and look at the rocks that make up New York and, and colorize them so we could see patterns, this is what New York State would look like. New York State, in many ways, is very complex. And in another way, it's very simple. And we're going to look at the simple part. The complex part is up here in the Adirondacks. This sort of blob in northern New York State is the Adirondack Mountains. And they formed over a billion years ago as part of a mountain building in Canada. And that's a piece of that that's still sort of stuck up there. And those rocks are mostly igneous and metamorphic rocks, like the piece of gneiss that you had, right? Um, that we saw before. So those rocks contain no fossils, but there are lots of minerals up there. We have a wonderful display in the geology lab room here, the earth science lab room, of some of those rocks from the Adirondacks. Perhaps we can see those later. The sort of middle part of New York we're going to talk about the most. If I could just talk about this, this section along the Hudson. You, you, you might have heard that there's this process called plate tectonics, where pieces of the surface of the Earth are actually in motion. They actually crash together, they pull apart, they grind up against each other, like the San Andreas Fault in California. And that process has been going on for billions of years. That process makes mountains. That's the main mountain-making process. And the Adirondacks were part of that. Now, now continents start out as kind of a, a nucleus of land. And they grow by a process called accretion. That is, we add to it. Like if you wanted to make a big snowball, you'd pick up a handful of snow and pack it, right? You wanted to make it bigger, you'd pack more, and pack more, and pack more, and pack more, and so on. And about a half a billion years ago, we started packing things over here. We started adding slices of other continents to the east coast of the United States. My current focus is in the state of Maine, looking at the volcanoes that formed 365 million years ago that produced the sediments that are in New York State. And what we're going to talk about tonight is this portion in New York State, across South Central New York State. Because this is sedimentary rock. It's only 380, maybe 400 million years old to about 365 million years old. OK? And that's what we're going to talk about. So let me catch my breath. I'm not used to lecturing with a mask on. Well, I'm fully vaccinated, but I think for now I'm going to try leaving it on. Okay. Except I have my beard growing, and it keeps getting in my mouth. So here we go. Let's talk about the local rocks. Our rocks are sedimentary rocks. They've been deposited through weathering processes, erosion, transportation, and deposition. And these rocks are fairly flat-lying. If you drive 
around the area, especially Kamikaze Curve. Actually, it's better to do this when you're not driving. When you're a passenger, look at the rocks on the side of the hills. Not the fake rocks that they made, which baffles me to no end, but the real rocks are flat-lying layers. And as you drive out to Oregon, to Elmira, to Corning, these layers continue for quite a long distance in New York State. It's what we call pancake geology. They're layered like pancakes on top of each other. And it turns out that when sedimentary layers form, the layer on the bottom is the oldest. Another layer gets deposited on top of that, another one on top of that, and so on. The youngest one is on the top. So we've got this layer cake geology here in New York State, and during plate tectonics, it tipped a little bit. Kind of broke and tipped a little bit. So what we're seeing is the youngest rocks along the southern border and older rocks up here through the Mohawk Valley and so on because they're tipped at about three degrees. So when you drive from Binghamton to Syracuse, you're going from younger rocks into older rocks. But these rocks are only 365 million years. Those are the youngest ones we have that are, we have here in Binghamton. The dinosaurs don't show up until about 200 million years ago. It's a 165 million year gap between our rocks in the dinosaurs. So there are no dinosaur fossils in New York. Oh, wait, that's not quite right. There is, a, New York State has a dinosaur, an official dinosaur. Anybody know what our official dinosaur is? Oh, how sad. Go ahead. It's not a bird, no. No, but I understand where you're going with that. It kind of looks like some of those really ancient birds, but it's called Coelophysis. You know Coelophysis? About the size of a big dog, carnivore. He could probably run faster than you could. Probably take a big chunk out of you if he really wanted to taste you. Um, when they built the George Washington Bridge, they put an on-ramp in New Jersey to the George Washington Bridge. And when they built the uh, on-ramp, they uncovered a layer that had some footprints from Coelophysis. Now that's in Fort Lee, New Jersey. But because it was for the George Washington Bridge in New York, it became our official dinosaur. Now for us that are older and maybe follow politics a little bit more, remember Governor Christie from New Jersey? Remember he had this problem with this ramp to the George Washington Bridge that got closed down for political reasons, apparently. That was the ramp that they found the dinosaur footprints. Incidentally, they paved over it successfully. Okay, so let's move on. We're going to talk about this section here. Now, geologists have been able to determine when things occurred on the Earth. There are techniques that we use that follow physical laws that allow us to calculate how old certain events are on the Earth. And we know that the Earth formed somewhere around four and a half billion years ago. That's give or take a day or so, but the Earth is probably about four and a half billion years old. For the first four billion years of the Earth's history, for 90% of our history, life on the Earth was boring. Life on the Earth considered, consisted of bacteria, a little bit later some algae, single-celled organisms, maybe a couple of really flimsy multicellular organisms, but most of the Earth's history did not have much in the way of fossils. So what we do is we look, if we're going to look for fossils, we look at about here, which is about a half a billion years ago. I, I'm rounding my numbers. I hope you don't mind. And from that point on, 
the last half a billion years of the Earth's history, the Earth is full of fossils. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at fossils in this period here that's called the Devonian period. The rocks of Binghamton are Devonian in age. And the Devonian is also known as the Age of Fishes. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So that's the period of time we're going to talk about. One of the things I had to do for one of my classes, and incidentally, this is a graduate class, and I was the only student in the class. Don't ever take a course where you're the only student in the class, because you can't fake not doing your homework. Anyway, one of the things we did is we constructed what we thought was the shape of the continent 365 million years ago. And this continent has a name. We call it the Old Red Sandstone Continent because it was first sort of identified in parts of England and Ireland. And they call it the Old Red Sandstone. So that's the name of the continent at this time. And interestingly enough, that accretion process, things getting plastered onto the continent, was occurring down here on what we call the Appalachian Peninsula. The Appalachian Mountains, especially right in here, the Acadian portion of that, were very active volcanoes. They were very actively building. These mountains were as high as any of the Rocky Mountains are today. It was a serious mountain chain. This is not Florida. Florida doesn't exist yet. Florida is actually a piece of Africa that got stuck on the U.S. when Pangea broke apart. So that's not Florida. That's the Appalachian Peninsula. And Binghamton was located on a shoreline of that peninsula. How are we doing? Everybody with me? Gets easier. Not right away, but it does get easier. I taught geology for 44 years at both Broome and Binghamton University, and I always tell my students, this is the most important diagram you'll know in this class, because this is the process called mountain building. This is how many mountains are formed. Not all mountains, but many mountains are formed. A particular group of mountains off the coast of Maine, called the Acadian Mountains, were formed by this process about 350 to 400 million years ago. And what happened was, is that part of another continent, a slice of another continent, now, how can that be? How can continents break up into slices? Well, does anybody know Baja California? Right? It's being peeled off of Mexico, and it's moving up towards the northwest along the San Andreas Fault. Let me know if you recognize any of these terms. And it's actually moving up so that in about 10 million years, Los Angeles will be part of San Francisco, or San Francisco will be part of Los Angeles, depending on where you're starting, I guess. Yes? I might want to point out to some of our younger audience that the origin of mountains Yeah. Okay. So, these slices peel off, and these slices can be pushed on the continents. That slice of Baja California and sort of Western California will slide up and eventually crash into Alaska, become part of Alaska in about 50 million years. Okay? So this peeling off of pieces and slamming them into other continents makes mountains. And we call mountain building an orogeny. That's O R O, orogeny, not E. Okay? And it goes through this process where it forms these volcanoes, it forms 
a what we call four-land sea. Eventually, the four-land sea gets filled in, and eventually it all gets weathered down to where we are today. So the deal is, this is the same process that was occurring on the East Coast when the rocks of this area were forming, and Binghamton would be on the shoreline of that inland sea, or foreland sea. And we've known that Binghamton is in this position for well over 100 years. Back in 1911, this particular diagram was drawn. It's of Pennsylvania, not New York. But Binghamton is up here uh, where it's labeled. And that's a shoreline that they've got us on at the time. The little triangle is one of the study areas I did near Nichols, New York. Actually, it's on the north side of the Susquehanna River in a town called Smithboro. Anybody know Smithboro? Those are the rocks I studied for my master's degree. And all of those fossils that we pulled out of there are on display at Broome Community College. So at this time, this is kind of what the area would look like. It's all a cartoon. It's just stylized. But you have the Acadian Mountains over here, off to the uh, sort of south and east of Binghamton. There are streams coming off those mountains. Those streams are going across a sort of a plain, uh, a flood plain. They come to a shoreline. There's a shelf out in front of the sea. There's a drop off from the shelf to the deeper part of the sea. And if we were to go in a car and go to Unadilla up Route 88, we would be on the land portion. Here in Binghamton, we're on the shoreline. At Smithboro, we're on the shallow shelf. Ithaca was on the slope. And then Corning would be at the deep part of the sea. The very cool thing is, is at Boom, we had three-hour labs. That means I could cram everybody into the college van and drive like a maniac, and we could visit those different geologic environments in that three-hour lab over a period of weeks. Couldn't have grown up in a better place to do this. So this is what things would have looked like at that time in a very stylized fashion. My, you still with me? Yeah. We'll get the pretty pictures in a minute. This is just a cross section through it. If we cut with a knife through it, Unadilla would be up here on the land surface. Binghamton would be at the shoreline. Smithboro and Nichols would be on the shallow shelf. Ithaca on that slope. And then Corning represents the deeper part of the sea. And the thing is, is we're going to find different kinds of fossils at different parts of this shoreline shallow sea business. The Devonian is known as the age of fishes. Known as the age of fishes because fishes proliferated. Previous this, to this time, fishes were much more primitive than most of the fishes today. At that time, fishes didn't even have a jaw, a bottom jaw. They were the jawless fishes. Made eating a little bit difficult, but apparently they managed to do it. It's also known as a period of extensive reef building in the United States. Yes? You need to, I'm a little hard of hearing, so speak loudly. This particular fish is not necessarily a coelacanth. Um, it's very closely related. Good spotting. How do you know that? Yeah, good for you. We'll talk about that guy in just a moment. And so that's what things that were living in the sea would look like. There were snails. You recognize a snail. There are seashells. Interestingly enough, these things are corals. They look like a carrot. They look like a carrot growing up out of the sea floor with a jellyfish on top of it. That's the living part of it. That's called the horned coral. You kids are all getting one tonight. 
And then there were these creatures that were squid-like creatures that had different kinds of houses. Some of their houses were long, straight kind of things, and some of them were coiled, um, called the nautiloids. At this time, we've got the beginning of multicellular life on the Earth. Here's the Devonian period. And you'll notice that the fishes really prolif proliferated during the Devonian period. We started getting different kinds of fish, including the, the coelacanth that's up here. And we're going to talk about those. We're going to call them lobe-finned fishes in a moment. And the reason why that's important, so good spotting, the reason why that's important is going to be revealed in just a moment. Some of these fishes were big. This is Dunkleosteus. We argue about how big things are in the past all the time. How big was Tyrannosaurus? How big was the biggest Brontosaurus or whatever? We argue about these things in science all the time. We argue about what happened to my... There we go. We argue about how big Dunkleosteus is. Three Dunkleosteus heads were found when they built Route 80 through Cleveland. One of those was in a museum where I did some studies for my PhD. They had one in that museum. I could actually crawl into the back of the head of that creature. It was a tight fit, but I could fit in there. His teeth, his teeth, now his teeth are not like teeth that you think of. When you think of like, um, a shark's tooth or something like that, which you're going to get tonight. They are, you know, made out of dentin. They're made out of a particular material. This guy's was bone. It was a different kind of tooth altogether. Not only that, but these are hard armor plates. These are hard bony plates. Why would something have hard bony plates? To protect itself from something. Well, what was it protecting itself from? Because the size estimates, most people estimate it to be about 30 feet in length. How big is the greatest white shark? 20 would be a very big one. Average ones are about 16 for, for real big ones, maybe 17. This guy was 30 feet. I've seen estimates that he was 80 feet long, which would make him the longest uh, of the fishes completely. But he was big and vicious, and we find bits and pieces of these things around here. But the real story comes from not just lots of different kinds of fishes in the sea, but some of these fishes had a different kind of a fin. Instead of having little thin bones in its fin, you catch a sunfish, or a bass, or something today, it's got these very little thin bones in its fin. Some of these creatures had bones that looked very different. They were actually what we call lobe-finned bones, or lobe-finned fish. And these lobe-finned fish eventually evolved into the terrestrial tetrapods, the four-footed creatures, the amphibians, the reptiles, the mammals, the humans. Your ancestor, your old, very old ancestor, your great, 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 great grandmother or whatever was a fish. Very much like a coelacanth. Well, most of the fossils you're going to find in this area are more mundane. They're not as exciting. But nonetheless, they are beautiful, they are numerous, and you'll get some tonight. These are your typical, what we call, bivalves that you can find in this area. A bivalve is related to a clam. A bivalve, bi means two, valve means shells. One thing you should notice is that there's no way that you can cut one of these in half, one shell in half, and have it look like the other half. There's no axis of symmetry on a single 
shell, a single valve. They are symmetrical between the valves, but one valve is not symmetrical. These are the bivalves or the clams. These are some of the ones you can find around here. Some of them can be quite large. A clam, again, has no symmetry about one shell, but is symmetrical between the shells. There's a more common thing you can find in this area called the brachiopod. In a brachiopod, the two shells are different. The axis of symmetry is not between the shells. Instead, a particular shell is symmetrical. You could cut it in half, and one half would look like the other half. And the brachiopods are very common around here. Here's one of my favorites. This is Cyrtospirifer. Actually, we have Cyrtospirifer shimongensis in this area, not disjunctus. But these are nice, big, beautiful brachiopods. This particular brachiopod up in the corner is called Mucrospirifer. Mucrospirifer mucronatus is what we call an index fossil. It tells us if you find a Mucrospirifer fossil that it is upper Devonian, about 365 million years in age, no matter where you find it. And we find it in Brazil, we find it in Russia, we find it in Europe, England, Australia, and so on. Some of the other fossils that you can find in this area include this thing, which is called a crinoid. And the crinoid is a very common fossil, but most of the crinoid that you find is just the disc. These discs that were part of what looks like a BS stem. It also had a root-like system, and then it had sort of a tulip-shaped bulb with feather-like feeding of the arms on it. So this looks like an animal or a plant. What do you think, young lady? Does this look like an animal or a plant? It looks like a plant. It's an animal, believe it or not. It's an animal. The deal is, is when they died, they disarticulated upon death. So you can find very thick concentrations of these little discs sometimes. You rarely find the stem. You very rarely find the top. I found maybe a dozen of them in all my years of collecting. There were other things like sponges, starfish. We found some nice starfish-like creatures both over at Binghamton University and at Endwell. And there are these things called the horn corals. Again, you're going to get some of these tonight, these things called horn corals. There are all kinds of snails. You're going to get a snail tonight, too. You get these turbinate snails called Bembexia. There's these long ones called Paleozygopleura, and so on. Different kinds of snails. Out of teaching for 44 years at Broom, my students and I collected lots of fossils, spent a lot of time identifying fossils, and this is a little outdated, but we're up to 78 different genera of fossils that could be found in this area, and no dinosaurs are listed. Another exciting story to be told by the rocks of this area is that this was a time that the land surface was starting to be populated, not just by amphibians or amphibian-like creatures, but by plants as well, by plants that you might recognize, things that look like trees, for instance, things that look like ferns. Uh, the Catskills are very well known for having these kind of fossils. There's a, a nice piece of a frond from one of these guys up here that came from deposit that was the land surface at the time. And so that's the story I came to tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. 
Well, the uh, Ophiurids that we have from Andwell, which are a brittle star, were never reported from New York at this age. So, so that is an unusual kind of a fossil. Um, we've also found things called Receptaculites, which we think are a cross between an algae and a coral, um, that are, again, the latest known occurrence of those fossils. Um, some other nice things that we found in the past, but nothing really unique. Probably the most exciting fossil that we ever found in this area was one of my students was working in a gravel quarry in Oigo and found parts of a mastodon. Now, that's a much more recent kind of fossil, 16,000 years old or so, instead of millions of years old, but they found quite a bit of it. And we have the femur at Broom, so nothing really exciting like a big dinosaur. Yes, sir. Oh, oh yes, yes. Wait, here we go. Uh, could, could you explain how the most recent glacial period uh, has exposed a lot of the uh, sedimentary rocks we see as well as creating like the Finger Lakes? That's a whole other talk. <laughs> <laughs> just, just you know, briefly. The forest. Okay, so over the last two million years, now this is the last two million years, not 365 million years ago, last two million years, the glaciers formed up in the Laurentia portion of Canada and expanded and moved outwards. They expanded outwards across the land surface. Here in Binghamton, we think we are on pretty much what's called a peneplain, a flat plain. And the Susquehanna just sort of wandered across this flat plain. And the glaciers came in. They pushed all kinds of material from Canada in upstate New York in front of them and left deposits of them, and that's, that's how we know how far they went. This happened not once, not twice in the two million years, not three times, but actually four times in the last two million years. And the last advance actually went into Pennsylvania about 50 miles. We actually had a little trouble getting up over the hills here in South Binghamton and, and Vestal. Now, a glacier doesn't draw back. It melts. And where does the water go? The ice here at Binghamton was probably something on the order of a half mile thick. When you go out during the day and you look at those puffy clouds and a blue sky, that the clouds are like sitting on a pane of glass. Do you know what I mean? The cumulus humulus clouds. Say yes. Thank you. Sure. They're about 3,000 feet. That's how high the, that's how thick the ice was. So when the water melted, the water drained to the south. Can't drain to the north. That's where the ice is. Drained to the south. So it carved these valleys. Carved these valleys a lot deeper than you can tell. For instance, in Binghamton, if you look at, you know, between Prospect Hill and whatever the hills on the other side, you know, just north of Binghamton. The valley itself is V-shaped, but it's filled with 200 feet of sand and gravel so it looks more U-shaped, like, like a glacial valley. So our valleys were dug very deep by the water that came off of those four advances, completely changed the topography of the area. That's my three-minute version. But okay. I can do a longer version, and I'm thinking about it. I have a question back here. Thank you. Um, my question's on, I guess, the I think it was the brachiopods and the axis of symmetry. Yeah. So have you, or are there any evolutionary fitness differences between organisms that have an axis of symmetry versus organisms that don't? Uh, so I, I guess also in that vein, does, does natural selection prefer organisms with an axis of symmetry or not? Well, that's, that's another lecture on a different day, but that's a good question. And I only have a partial answer. I, I don't know the whole answer to that, to be honest. But it is important. 
most objects, most natural objects, have some kind of symmetry. For instance, what's the most common symmetry of fruit? Did you know fruit was symmetrical? Look at a blueberry. Okay? Cut a banana in half, not the long way, but across, and look at it. It's five-fold symmetry. Okay, so nature does seem to like these symmetrical shapes. It's probably a, a mechanical packing kind of a thing. Now, when we study fossils, when I start my students out, how to identify fossils, first thing we look at is the axis of symmetry. So, yeah, it does seem to be a plan. I don't know how or why. I don't know if it's universal, but I know I use it. So that's a good question. Which one of my students had asked me that one time? <laughs> any, other did. any other questions? Oh, got another one back here. Joel, and then we'll go to you. Are you familiar with local fossils that contain what appear to be bits of the original shell material? There are some, not a lot, and it's probably not original. And that's a real good question, as it turns out. Um, I'm, I'm going to start by answering it something else first. When we look at shells, fossil shells, if we look at things during the Paleozoic, which goes from about a half a billion to about a quarter of a billion years ago, those shells are all calcite which is a form of calcium carbonate. It's a specific atomic structure of calcium carbonate. There's a, a bit of it right here on this one. It has some of the original shell. Um, and it's calcite, calcium carbonate. After about 250 million years ago to today, all marine organisms produce calcium carbonate as aragonite, which is a different atomic structure. We don't know why there was a shift. The question is, really, why are the Paleozoic ones calcite and why are the rest aragonite? We think that it could be answered by a recrystallization, that those rocks are so old, they're, 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 they're so altered by time that aragonite, which is less chemically, uh, let's see, thermodynamically stable, would convert to calcite over time. So I can't answer your question, is that original material or is that recrystallized? Now most of the fossils that you're going to find in this area, the original shells have weathered out because of their profound age and the effects of the glaciers being able to, you know, penetrate the, the rocks below them with, with water. So, so, so that's, let me start over on that one. That's not a good way to say it. Let me say it a different way. Let me rewind the tape. Um, you know, that the weathering in this area has been so profound because of the glaciers and so on that you don't often find any shell material at all. They're all molds and casts. The, this is a crinoid stem, um, and it's gone. It's weathered away. So unless you are quarrying rock and digging up a lot of rock, you're not going to find shell material. So did I answer your question or confuse it? OK. Darn, I tried to confuse you. All right, well, let's see if he can. We'll yes. see what happens. Uh, so you talked about with Baja California and San Andreas Fault and changing there. How is the how are the plate tectonics changing on this side of North America? Wait, what was the last part of it? How are the plate tectonics changing on this side of North America? Well, we've shifted completely from a California kind of situation where things were being pulled up a, a giant fault and plastered onto the eastern part of the United States. It's shifted now. When Pangaea pulled us, pulled us together to form a supercontinent, when it broke apart, it formed a mid-ocean ridge, which is now in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So all the action is out there, and nothing's going on in the east coast at all. 
that ancient fault that things were coming up actually could be traced from somewhere in Georgia to under deposit New York. And, and then in the Acadias, it's called the Norumbega Fault. It's another big fault. There, there are these big strike slip faults that things are being pulled up along and plastered on. All right, we do have a question on the, uh, from our live stream. Oh, wow. uh, Cindy asks, uh, when did the sea uh, Bington was on, uh, on the shoreline, fill in, and what caused that? Well, if we go back to that mountain building slide, um, eventually the weathering of the Acadian Mountains filled in the sea. About it just sort of eroded and just sort of covered the, things in. Right. Seas have covered New York State several times in the past, there was one earlier called the Salina Sea that produced the salt layers that we have at depth in, in New York State. Um, so the United States has been invaded by shallow seas many times in the past. All right, very good. Any other questions uh, here? Um, you had mentioned that you know, people could bring up rocks and everything. I have a rock I'd like to have you uh, look at for a second. Uh-oh. I knew there was going to be a test. It's a special one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is awesome. Here's, here's the rarest rock you'll ever, you'll ever hold. And this is? It's a rock that was returned by Apollo 17. It was the most recent, I won't say the last, it was the most recent mission to the moon. And we have it here for another 10 days. It, it's returning to NASA. Uh, on Monday the 10th, Monday the, whatever, the 15th. So uh, if you haven't been up here and seen it already, I'll have it on this display case over here. But they're definitely, you know, uh, <laughs> we have cameras. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the value of it is so high, it might be worth it. <laughs> um, Let's not go down that road. Yeah, that's not, please. I, um, <laughs> yeah, this is a north of site, right? I thought, I believe it was basalt. Is it basalt? It looks yeah. very coarse grain for a basalt. Well, there's a little description over here, so let me go and read it. And let's see what they have to say. It says, This Apollo 17 lunar sample was collected by astronaut Schmidt near the landing site of the Taurus Litro Valley, the region of the moon. The rock weighs 77 grams. It is a fragment of the original rock, which weighed 5,765 grams. The sample is a mar basalt. Oh, okay. This rock, like all mar basalts, is very old, about 3.75 billion years old, and it's older than 99.99% .99 of all surface rocks. Are we passing this around? Um, I will probably put it here on the... Um, okay. And so people can come up and okay. take a look at it. Yeah. I'll return it to you then. Oh, it, do, we have, do we have another question here? And I'll take that. I thought it was appropriate because this is a... a stone cast in resin and we just have kits we have a pyramid kit in resin and is it sacrilegious to cast stones other than from outer space in resin does it ruin the fossil well i mean uh, she asking about uh, the fact that we encapsulated it in, in resin it's well, basically this was meant to be used as a as a demonstration or you know a, something that people could, could view at. Um, like I know that if you, people say that, well, I went to the uh, Smithsonian down in Washington, D.C., and I touched the moon rock that they have there. Actually, what you've done is you've touched the, the hand grease of the five billion other people who have tried to touch that moon rock. But um, actually, but to that end, they did a, a very interesting thing. When they brought the uh, Apollo samples, uh, lunar samples back, they were obviously, you know, examining them, but they also set aside a portion of those rocks because they figured, you know, in 50 years, the technology that will develop to, to study these rocks will develop. And so they actually set aside a, a portion of these things in, a, in some kind of a gas bath that, that just keeps our atmosphere away from it, and they are now just beginning to study right. those, uh, those lunar samples that came down. And they have really strict protocols about even dealing with any of these materials because we have never known whether there might be a virus or something on some of these moon rocks that could wipe out life on the Earth. So they've been very strict about 
how these things are, are studied and handled, right? Absolutely, yep. Any other questions for me? Well, I guess um, what we'll do here is if you have any further questions or if you've got some rock samples you'd like the test yeah. or field to uh, examine, uh, please bring them on up. Um, again, tonight is an extraordinary night, uh, especially here in the southern tier. We don't always get nights like this. It's, it's crystal clear out. We have a great scene. So we've got Saturn in our 14-inch. We have uh, Jupiter in our 6-inch uh, telescope. We also have some scopes out in the yard. Um, to get to those uh, telescopes, you're going to go through uh, the lobby, through the double doors, and then go to the left. When you walk into, uh, into the observatory, the, the scope on the right is what we call it, our 14-inch. Uh, but in order to see Saturn, we actually have to put a, a, a hatch down to, to move the, the ladder around to. So we'll sort of take a, a lump of people that will be able to, to view Saturn, and then, um, then we'll do an exchange. But you can go to Jupiter. But also we'll get Jupiter and Saturn and some scopes in the yard as well. Wait, uh, uh, I have one more thing. Yes, please. I, I brought these bags of rocks. You know, believe it or not, my, my other job is, is Santa Claus. And this is what Santa Claus does during the summer. I brought a bunch of rocks. These are uh, some minerals that I thought were pretty and some local fossils. And I brought them for, I think I have enough for each child. So you're welcome to have these, but you need to listen for just one moment. Okay. These are a choking hazard, okay? They're not meant to be eaten. We don't eat rocks. <laughs> the shark's teeth in here are sharp. They are sharp enough to cut you. Even though they're 10 million years old, they can still cut you. You need to be careful with the shark's teeth. I recommend that the child work with the parents with these things, but I brought bags of rocks. So come on up and get a bag of rocks. All right, well, thank you again, Professor Ophiel. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you for coming. We look forward to, uh, again, the rule here is you cannot leave Copernic until you look through a telescope. So get out there and check off that box. I brought a rock. Okay. It's not a fossil, but I can't bring it in. Okay.